If you uh, haven't been here, we have been just kind of taking the last few weeks to really look at the vision and the mission and the values and the commitments that we're making. And so we've said, hey, we want to um, really make sure that we keep simple church simple, right? It'd be uh, terrible to say in 5, 10, 15, 20 years that simple church is now complex church, right? And so we're just trying to make sure that we stay focused, mission focused, vision focused. We are a family of believers uh, coming together to change our world as we join Jesus to seek and save all who are far from God. So uh, we want to, uh, we don't do the seeking and saving, right? Jesus does, but we join him in that and we want to see our world change. So it'd be sad for us to also look back 10, 15 years later and we go like, hey, we really haven't changed our world. Uh, it would be sad for you to say, hey, I did all the things of Simple Church, but it didn't really change me, right? Uh, but, but we are calling and desiring that we would be changed, that we would join people and see them changed, and that we would not just be better like Christians, not just be better doing the stuff, the things, but actually our life being changed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today we are going to look uh, at our three commitments. So we've said, hey, we want our church to be as easy as one, two, three, and ABC. So we've kind of looked at it. One vision, right? Simple church exists to change our world as we join Jesus to seek and save all who are far from God. You may say, uh, Frank, that's a long thing right there. Well, join Jesus. Join Jesus seeking and saving to change our world, right? Then two goals. Our two goals are gathering and scattering. We talked about that last week. If you have the app, you can click on the YouTube channel icon there, or you can go to Right Now Media and click on the Simple Church logo, and it should bring you up to the YouTube channel, Channel, or you go to YouTube and just type in Simple Church CC if you missed a couple weeks, so you can kind of catch up to where we are. But then we also have these three commitments. We are followers, we are family, and we are friends. And then we've said that it really uh, is about us moving forward in faith in Jesus, and we move forward in our faith by A, B, C, uh, A, admit, B, believe, and C, confess. And these are really the way we get into faith with Jesus Christ, but it's the way we continue to be in a close and intimate relationship with Jesus. I think this is where the disconnect is for us a lot of times. A lot of times the disconnect is, is that we often get into the thing, but we're not moving closer and closer and closer in relationship with him, right? It'd be like as if uh, Ann and I, 22 years ago, moved into the same address, but we never talked from then on out. That's called prayer, right? Uh, right? Like that's called praying to God, and we, we actually have to talk to Him. We actually have to talk with our spouse. We actually have to be in close relationship and moving forward. And so today we're going to look at our three commitments, followers, family, and friends. Now, listen, if you've been at our household, uh, there has been a constant discussion about the order of these things, followers, family, friends. And when I think about this, Ann and I have gone back and forth, uh, but when I think about this, I think about this moment that happened at a Valenzano family Christmas, not just our immediate family, but a Christmas with my mom, my dad, my sister, and my brother-in-law. And I was doing uh, something that was uh, probably driving my mom crazy. Um, I, was, I was being authentically frank right in that moment. And uh, she looked at Anne and she apologized. She said, I'm so sorry. And then she said this, I'm sorry, but, right? But Anne, you are actually the only person in this house that chose Frank. <laughs> right? These kids, they didn't get a choice in who, who their dad was. My mom didn't get a choice in who her son was. My sister and my brother-in-law didn't get a choice. And so as we think about followers, family, and friends, we're thinking about the progression that happens in our lives. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we become his followers or talk about what that really means to believe in him in just a second. But then when we become a follower, we are put in the family of God. And guess what? You don't have a choice who gets in the family, right? When God saves somebody, he saves them and he brings them into this big, giant, big C church, right? that is all over the world, universal, that does not look just like us. This is a universal church that God is bringing us into the family of God. And there's some people in that family that you have to learn to love, right? Because you didn't get to choose them, God chose them. And because of that, he has brought us into family. And so we realize that we have to put our will aside and we have to walk in his will and his way to be connected one with another. And then we are friends. 
And we'll talk this, uh, this morning about how friends lay their lives down for one another. And so our desire is, is that we would be growing as followers, that we would be investing and committed to the family, and that we would be friends who serve one another, both inside this room and outside, that we would love those that are far from God. Now, I have a great, giant, huge task to do. I'm going to take you quickly through three different passages of Scripture, uh, three different passages of Scripture. I'm going to give you a large context, the immediate context, and I'm going to give us some application points. So hold on, let's go. So as we look at these commitments, we'll see that some involve a choice and others involve being born again into the family. So I want us to see this truth this morning, that followers, family, and friends join Jesus and commit. You say, Frank, commit to what? Period. Followers, family, and friends, we join Jesus and we commit. We commit. We're all in. We're all in with our life. Well, we commit to his plan. Yes. We commit to him. Yes. We commit to everything that he would call us to. So I want to give us three ways that we join Jesus and commit. Number one is this. Followers join Jesus through belief in his plan and commit to personal growth. Believe in his plan and commit to personal growth. You say, Frank, in his plan or do we believe in Jesus? Yes, Jesus. But I want to tell you that Jesus is not just as some happy-go-lucky thing where I can kind of commit to it and then decommit and commit and decommit and commit and decommit, right? This is in college football, right? This is in college football that we can commit and then decommit, commit and then decommit. No, we're committed and we're committed to his plan and his plan has specifics. Belief in Jesus is more than just knowing mentally about him, right? It's not just knowing him even with our head and our heart. But it is believing that he existed and it is believing in his plan of redemption and rescue. And that when he calls us and draws us in, he calls us to commit wholeheartedly to what he has called us to, not to our desire of him, right? Jesus is not a cosmic vending machine. He is not a cosmic vending machine. We don't get to go to him and say, Jesus, this is how I want to commit. B23, give me my uh, whatever, you know, if it was me, probably a, a three musketeers is what I want. Right. I mean, that's just my go-to candy of choice. I know, uh, that's, it's, uh, chocolate air as a friend of mine would call it. Right. Uh, but he's not that to us, right? He doesn't just give us this, but we commit to his plan. Well, you say, Frank, what is his plan? Then I'll, I'm glad you asked the question because I want to read Luke chapter nine, verse 23 and 25. And I want you to see his plan for our life. It says this in Luke nine, 23 to 23 through 25. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to follow after me, if you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself? lost or destroyed. Now listen, if these were frank words, I have nothing to back them up with. But these are Jesus's words. And he is God in the flesh. And he says, like, listen, if you want to be my follower, there's three things you got to do, right? Uh, the New Living Translation says, give up your own way. I, I learned it as deny yourself, right? Take up your cross daily and follow me. Now listen, the larger context of this verse is Jesus is teaching, he's preaching, he's healing. Later in this verse, we will see that the scripture said, or later in this chapter, in chapter 9, 51, it's like the center point of Luke. Luke up there to this point is like him preaching, teaching, and healing. Luke 9, 51 is the center point where he, it says, scripture says, he resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem, which means he knew he was going and he was going to be brutally murder. And he has grown both in popularity and polarity, right? He is polarizing some people and he is popular to others. Immediately before this text, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. Verses 21 and 22, he says, listen, the son of man is going to suffer terrible things. He'll be rejected and he will be killed and he will be raised on the third day. And in this passage, he details for those who are listening what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If we are followers, it is a three-step process. One, deny yourself. Ugh. Can we just be honest? Jesus, we're not a fan of the three-step process already. 
right? You were only in step one and we're not a fan. Deny yourself. Give up your own way. Two, take up your cross and win daily, right? Take up your cross daily. And third, follow me. So go after all that he has. We join him as we are not only believing these things, but living out a life of sacrifice. Listen, Jesus calls us to commit to personal growth through personal death. I want to say that again. Jesus calls us to commit to personal growth through personal death. If um, my, my brother-in-law at his wedding, not, my, uh, not the brother-in-law, uh, well, he didn't get to choose me either, I guess, but uh, not the brother-in-law I was talking about earlier, but Ann's baby brother. I, he's a g- grown man, but I call him baby brother because he's nine years younger than us. And um, just a baby, just a baby. And he was this tall when we got, he was Ann's height when we got married. Uh, and so now he's almost my height. But um, when we got married, they had the, or when he got married, they had the Bible open and they said, hey, write your favorite Bible verse. Uh, or in there, or parentheses around it, and write your name next to it. This is it. This is me, John twelve twenty four. It's not that I love it, right? Not that I love it because I love it, want to walk in it, but because it's the truth. I tell you the truth: unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servant must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Listen, we're called to be planted in this world for a season until we live eternally with him, but when we're planted, we die to ourself. And I just want to tell you, that is hard. Why? Because I want my desires all the time, and so do you, right? We want our desires. We want our earthly desires. We, we live in this broken vessel, but we are called to commit to personal growth through personal death. Listen, we are called to be followers of him. We're called to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow me. And that is all of us in the work of Jesus Christ. If you're coming to him for the very first time today, if you're here and you're like on the outside looking in on this thing, you want to come to Jesus, then I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to die. You're going to have to die to self. You're going to have to take up your cross and you're going to have to follow after him. That is the call of Jesus Christ. If somebody has watered it down for you and you you believed in something other than that, you have believed in a lie. You've believed in your own personal desire of Jesus. But if we're going to believe in him, we've got to know that he is calling us to die to ourselves and to walk and follow him in all ways, shapes, or forms. Listen, not only are we to be followers, but secondly, we see that we're called to be family. Here's the second truth, or the second commitment. Family joins Jesus through obedience and commit to his church. And commits, really. is I have it commits here, but I didn't change it there. Family joins Jesus through obedience and commits to the church. Listen, obedience isn't just doing the right things. Obedience is doing the right things at the right time with the right spirit and attitude. Ugh. Spirit and attitude, Frank, right? And listen, we know this. Any parent in this room, you know it, right? You know it. It's not just doing the right things. It's doing the right things at the right time with the spirit and attitude, right? You can ask your kids, right? I could say, hey, Deacon, would you, um, would you go get the trash can from the road and would you bring it back? Right spirit, right time, right attitude, doing the right thing is him going, sure, Dad, I got it. Boom. Now, listen. I'm not outside. He can be going the whole time. I'm fine with that. God's probably not fine with that, but I'm fine with that, right? Because he said, sure, dad, I'll go get it. But if I say, hey, Deacon, go get the trash can from the side of the road. And, and, and then like 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes a day later says, hey, Deacon, I thought I asked you to go get that thing from the road. It's a timing issue, right? When God asks us to do something, he asks us to do it at the right time. But then, right, he could go, I could tell him, Deke, go get that trash can. And he could be walking out the door at the right time, but he could go, oh, dad, why do we always have to get the trash cans? Why do we all make all this trash, right? And I'm like, dude, obedience. 
right? It's a track. It's, it's 50 feet down there. And that's what God is looking to us and saying, listen, obedience is just doing, in just doing the right things. It's doing the right things at the right time, at the right spirit, with the attitude that God is desiring. Listen, in a couple of weeks, it'll be uh, Labor Day, and we're gonna, I'm going to preach a message called Thank God It's Monday, right? Everybody says thank God it's Friday, but thank God it's Monday. We're going to talk about what it means to labor for the Lord and to go to our workplaces and celebrate Him there and go, thank you, God, for this job that you've given me and for the people that I can minister to and love and care for. It's the attitude in which we go. Listen, Matthew chapter 12, 46 through 50 says this. It's a passage of Scripture where we find Jesus talking about His family. It says this, as he was speaking to the crowd, his mothers and brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Basically saying, who's my family? Then he pointed to his disciples in the crowd there that he was speaking to. And he said, look, these are my mothers and brothers. Uh, they are my family. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven walks in obedience. They are my brother and sister and mother. Listen, the larger context is the same as we were in Luke. Jesus preaching, teaching, and healing. He's grown in popularity and polarity. You've heard that before, right? Just a second ago. But the immediate context here is Jesus is being blasted by the Pharisees and the teachers of the laws because he has broken the Sabbath. In Matthew chapter 12, uh, earlier on in the chapter, he's picking grain as he's walking through the grain fields on a Sunday morning. And people are like, you can't do that on a Sunday morning. You can't work on a Sunday morning. Well, then we wouldn't have these chairs in here for you to sit in. And we wouldn't have the signs out and the kids ministry area put up. We wouldn't have moved stuff in the trailer at the end. We'd just be like, we can't do anything. Like, no, the, the Sabbath is made uh, not, not for just the rules, but for the betterment of the people. And they're like, hey, you can't pick grain as you're walking because that's work. It's like, listen, I'm not harvesting grain. I'm just trying to get something to eat for me and my, me and my, I was going to say posse, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, right. And then, and then later in Matthew chapter 12, uh, healing, he heals on the Sabbath, right? It's got a, a guy with a withered arm. He comes into the worship service. Now, listen, uh, if, if, if something was like that today, I don't have that power, right? That's not in me, but it was in Jesus. A guy with a withered arm walked in on the Sabbath and he's talking and he's like, hey, I'm going to make your hand whole. And that guy's hand went, I don't know if it was it withered like tiny, small. Was it just drawn up? I don't know. But he had use of it when it was finished. And the Pharisees begin to argue with Jesus as he, and he shares this passage to help the crowd understand that those who are in the family aren't just doing religious things, but they're doing the true will of God. They're not just the religious elites. They're not just the people that know the laws and are trying to do the laws, but they actually are part of the family and they're listening to God. So followers are called to do God's will and family are called to do God's will, walk in obedience. And instantly, as we become part of the family, this global church, both the global church and the local church, we realize are filled with messy people. Look around, right? Right? I don't have to look very far to recognize that the local church is filled with messy people. You know how I found out this morning? I woke up, I walked in, and I looked in the mirror. Right? Now, I could have said, I woke up, I turned over, but I'm not that dumb, right? I said that second, not first, right? Listen, I know I'm messy. I know I'm messy. But here's the deal. You're messy, but we're part of the family. And as we said last week, we've got to be called to live and walk in unity. Because there's only two types of people in this world, sinners and save sinners. Sinners and save sinners. Sinners and save sinners. And you know who can know who's who? You and me. I can know about me. Thank God I'm a save sinner. Because you wouldn't want me, uh, uh, you wouldn't want me without Jesus in my life. I'm just being honest with you. Say, Frank, no, no, we would like, we would like, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. And I wouldn't want you. And that's why we do what we do. So we can bring people to fruition of what God has planned for them from the very foundations of the earth. And we must learn and grow to love all. Would you say that word with me? All. Would you say it? All. And think of the people that are in this room that might just be a little bit different than you, that rub you a little bit the wrong way. Those people. Yeah. And the people that are at your workplaces that, that you need to love, that rub you the wrong way. All oh, we need to learn 
to grow to love all those who are in our family. Uh, if you, uh, I, when I when we started the church, I gave you a sheet, and I in my in my computer it's saved as like uh, a vision on a page, and it has this phrase next to this verse next to "We are called to be family." We will be a healthy family for eternity. We will be a healthy family for eternity, and we need to be a healthy family starting now, right? Healthy family has conflict. They just work it out, right? Can we say that? Do we believe that? Healthy family has conflict. They just work it out, right? There's, there's not a, every moment where Anne's been like, Frank, you are the apple of my eye, and I desire you uh, more than any human being on the face of the planet. There's been moments where she's been like, I just can't even talk to you right now. Please get out of this room or I'm leaving out of this room, so I don't, right, the old mom phrase, right, if you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all, sometimes you just got to do that, right, and listen, we've got to learn how to be a healthy family, not just in eternity, but now, let's start practicing, listen, I'm going to tell you, there is nothing more attractive to the lost people than a church that loves one another, we won't do it perfectly, we won't do it perfectly, but we will strive to go, right? I mean, I wish we had an hour of time to talk more about this, but then uh, if Ryan wrongs me, guess what? I'm supposed to go to Ryan, right? Or Ryan's supposed to run to me and say, hey, I wronged you. Hey, you wronged me. And we're supposed to work it out. Why? Because we're family. We want to love one another. We want to work and strive for the community of, of faith that's greater and larger than me because I'm call, called to do what? As a follower, what? deny myself, right? Give up my own way. Ryan, I'm lame. I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? And you know what? If he gives it or if he doesn't give it, I'm going to love him. And that's what we're called to live in and be. Maybe we need a, a sermon series on forgiveness sometime soon. Transition. Uh, I'm reading my notes now. I'm like, uh, we're called to be followers. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's in orange. All my transitions are in orange. Uh, <laughs> transition. We're called to be followers, family, and finally, friends. Listen, friends, join Jesus through service and commit to those far from God. Listen, we're com committed to the family, but we're also be committed to those far from God. Listen, the word service at Simple Church doesn't include this moment. It never will include this. Hey, when's our worship service? Hey, when's our this service? When's our that? No, it's like serving, right? This is our worship gathering. You want to gather and then we want to scatter. We want to gather and we want to scatter. So when we think about service, it's literal serving the body. And we call this a meeting or gathering and service has to do with just serving people, both the body of Christ and those far from God. John chapter... I don't know what's going on with me, but I was going to read John chapter 15, 13. I'm like just reading it now. It's bad. Sorry. I digress. John 15, 13 uh, through 15 says this. It says, there is no uh, greater love. Sorry. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told, from, told me. Now listen, here's the deal. This context is very different than the previous two. Jesus is at the end of his life. He is sitting in the upper room with the twelve. He is gathered knowing he's about to move from this moment to the garden to sweat blood for them to come grab him. And then the next few uh, hours and days are brutal, right? His primary ministry in his last days was more teaching and less healing and more to his kind of close group. So Jesus is in the upper room. He's sharing an intimate meal and conversation with his disciples. Jesus calls those who do what he commands 
friends. He says, listen, while we are, no, we are no longer slaves to God and slave this relationship, but a friend desires to serve by laying down their lives for the good of those who are both in the family and those who are far from God. He says this in verse 12, right before that passage. This is my command. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Listen, we are called to lay our lives down for our friends and for those who are far from God. Why do we set up the chairs? Why do we move in the stuff? Why do we do the things? Who, who, would have, who would have known that moving the chairs on an angle would have made such a huge difference for people? I mean, I can't tell you how many people walked in and they were like, oh, that, I like that. That's a, that angle, that's pretty good. That's amazing. We did it because we were trying to fit 10 more chairs in this room. That's why. It makes a big difference. Why do we do that? Why, do we, why would we do that? Well, yeah, I want you to be able to sit somewhere. There's a lot of people out there that are on our Be Intentional cards that we'll talk about next week that we want to come in this room so they can hear about Jesus, so they can enjoy the fellowship of one another, not just so they can gather here, but so then we can gather in groups and we can grow together and serve one another. Serving shows our maturity. Remember what we said last week? We are always maturing. We are never mature. And it shows our maturity because we have truly understood the denying ourselves, the taking up our cross daily and following him. I read this in the book Heaven uh, by Randy Alcorn. He says this, service is a reward, not a punishment. Service is a reward, not a punishment. This idea is foreign to people who dislike their work and only put up with it until uh, retirement. He's talking about what it will be like in heaven, but he says, listen, service is a reward. He says, listen, we will have jobs in heaven. We will serve the body of Christ in some way, shape, or form in heaven, and we will do that here too. And so we're called to serve one another. It's a reward, not a punishment. I get to, in just a second, put this chair on the rack I get to uh, uh, serve our church through leading a small group. I get to uh, serve our church as we, as we do different things in our community to, to serve teachers, to serve this, this campus uh, here that we meet at DeSoto Christian Academy. We get to do these things, and it is a joy. Now listen, I've told you, uh, if it's in pink, it's a do-say thing, right? It's in pink. Here's a danger. Danger for us, for you and for me when it comes to serving. Listen, consumerism, a consumerism mindset pervades the church. Consumerism mindset pervades the church. It's primarily about me. I am the center and my needs are preeminent. The consumer-based person believes that the ministry of the church is to meet his or her needs. And I want to tell you, being healthy followers, family, and friends is ha hard because everything in this world and our American culture leads us to being the main character of our own story. Everything in this world, everything in this world leads us to, to being the main character of our own story. Not, 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 I'm not talking about Jesus stuff, I'm talking about our world. Hey, have you had this? You got this? You do this? Keeping up with the Joneses? Everything. And the consumer mindset is dangerous for you and for me. It's dangerous that us, that we would run in that and we would want those things. And so if we're going to be healthy followers, family, and friends, we've got to push against that, push against it. So I want to ask you this question today. And it's not something that I can answer for you. It's not something that your neighbor sitting next to you can answer for you. But it's only an answer that you can make. How committed are we to being followers, family, and friends? How committed are we to being followers, family, and friends? Listen, if you believed and trusted in Jesus, you're in the first category. But to, to continue in the first category, you need personal growth. You need to commit to that personal growth, to be reading, to be praying, not to be doing it for doing sake, but to be doing it because we want to. If you're, if you're a follower, then you're already in the family, right? But are you loving the family that God has given to you? Are you walking alongside them and encouraging them and moving together forward with them? Go back to that question. Sorry, Dee. Um, and then how committed are you to being friends? Are you willing to jump in and serve and lay your life down for your friends? Now, I just want to tell you, when I wrote this word, 
committed. And when I put these three commitments down way back uh, in uh, September and October of last year, I just want to tell you, I knew the word I was clearly using. It was not happenstance. It was not accidental. It was on purpose. We have to be, as believers, committed, and we need commitment. And can we just be honest? We have commitment issues in our world. We have commitment issues in our world. We think this, how and when can I get out of this commitment? How and when can I get out of this commitment? Um, in this season of uh, my life, I have been um, doing some random substitute teaching here, there, and yonder. And I was in a classroom, pr primarily at, uh, at Ann's school, I was in the classroom um, on Friday. And students were working on a uh, resume builder type thing. And then they were having to figure out what they would make at their possible job. And they were, I mean, it was, it was like you could see their brains leaking out of their ears because they were seeing the dollars just going out the doorway, right? I mean, just, and they're like actually having to do real adult things and think about a, a car. And you could hear them say like, oh my goodness, I don't want the Tesla that costs this much money. I want this car or I might just keep my own car right now. And like seeing all those things. And just to be honest with you, in a crazy, wild conversation that happened literally in front of me, um, there's like, well, I'm going to do a prenup if I'm making all that money. Because what if I get tired of that person and I just want them out? And I just want to tell you, like a little piece of my heart broke. Because I'm just a substitute. Like I'm Pastor Frank's substitute. And, uh, and I, I did say to them, like, maybe you should go home and thank your parents for all that they've provided for you. Oh, man, they, I pay my gas money. I said, no, I'm talking about like the cost that it takes like just to get you to this place in point. Now, I did say that, but I couldn't look at them and go, hey, I, let me tell you, while you're talking about this, I'm writing about commitment right here on my sermon because you're doing all your schoolwork and you're being quiet and I'm working on this thing. And I want to tell you about it. Didn't have the opportunity to do it but I do have the opportunity to tell you we got to look at commitment. Because listen, there's a bunch of things that I'm committed to and you're committed to and we're committed to that when we get to heaven, they're not going to matter. My kids hate for me to say this, but I say it to them all the time. That's going to burn up at the end anyway. It's going to burn up at the end. It's going to burn up. It is the wood, hay, and stubble is what Jesus, is what Jesus called it, Right? It's not the permanent thing. I want to tell you, we just sang about it earlier when we sang the song Abandoned. Jesus' commitment led him to the cross for us. Jesus' commitment led us to the cross. Led him to the cross for us. Doug Newton said this about this passage in uh, deny, taking up your cross, denying yourself, and laying your life down. He said this, the true cross of Jesus calls you to lose what you may never regain, to give what others may never deserve, and perhaps, but not, but, but, and perhaps, but only perhaps, others will see the love of God demonstrated in your grace. Frank, what if I, what if I deny myself what if I take up my cross daily? What if I lose it all for you, Jesus? And the big C word swings into my life. Right? And I got to walk through that. What if cancer comes into my life? Lord, what if I, what if I die to myself and I begin to share with someone and they never come to faith in Jesus Christ. Is it worth it? Scripture would say it is worth it because it's all about our obedience to the Father. So are we committed? Listen, when we enter into suffering in this world, we become like Him. And we are called to give up our own way, take, take up our cross, and follow after Him. There's, um, there's weeks in which uh, I get to preach and then I get to leave out and I'm like, man, I feel like I was an encourager. Uh, like 
like a real encourager, right? This is an encouraging message because we need to look at it. But it's like, these are exciting things and we're pumped and this is what God is doing. And man, it's, it's, he's growing us and he's doing. And then there's other weeks where I, like I, I have to walk out and I'll be like, this is heavy. Like, this is hard. But I want to tell you, um, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. If we could just get it. Here's what I need us to think today. It's so worth it, not just for us, but it's so worth it for whoever is down the line that we are going to share our faith with. Whoever's going to sit in the empty seats that are in this room right now. It's so worth it for them. So for those of us continuing the journey with Jesus, it takes A, B, C. A, admit that I'm a sinner. B, believe. And C, confess. A, admit that God, sometimes I choose not to deny myself, but I want to just desire what self wants. B, Jesus, sometimes I don't believe that you truly gave it all for me, and so I try and pull myself up by my bootstraps. And C, Lord, I really don't want to confess what I already know because you know it. But what Jesus is calling us to do is to A, admit that we sometimes get off track and we have a plan that's better than our own. And the cool thing is when we admit and we be believe and we see confess and we say, Jesus, I'm committing to you, you know what he does? He holds his arms open wide and he is pumped to receive us, i.e. Uh, Luke chapter 15, prodigal son, right? I mean, he's like running after us. So if you're continuing the journey today, this is what it takes. Just ask the question, Jesus, where, where do I struggle with being a follower? Where do I struggle with being a family member? Where do I struggle with being a friend? But today, today you may have heard for the very first time that faith in Jesus is as simple as A, B, C, A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he's not some cosmic vending machine trying to give you what you want, but he is trying to give you the desires of his heart that are better than anything we could possibly imagine. And C, confess. So, I know we're already committed, but are we ready to lay down our lives even more to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ? I want to pray for us. And before Randall comes to close, I want to give us um, uh, two little announcements that are not on there, and then I want us to, uh, uh, Randall, come and close us. Father, today, Lord, we just ask that you would be leading us, guiding us, directing us. Help us to be committed to the things that you would have us to be committed to. Father, being followers and family and friends. Father, help us to do the hard work this week to evaluate our lives and what needs to go and what needs to stay, what needs to be added. Lord, what needs to be deleted from our lives? And Father, I pray that you would just lead God and direct us in all things to denying ourselves, to taking up our cross, and to following after you. Lord, I'm thankful for this family of believers, this local body, and for what you're doing, and how you're growing us, and how you're moving us to be more like you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just do unreal things in and through us. Father, that we would continue to just see you move in might and power in our own lives and in those that we love and care for. Jesus, we praise you. We give you the honor and the glory, for you deserve it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's join Jesus this week.